Better nutrition, which is basically what, uh, what the core of my talk's about, whether it's athletic performance or other types of performance. So kind of just a full gamut of what performance is. I'll be talking about how to prove that through what we eat. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a little background first. I started off in 1990. I started running track in high school. And I just really enjoyed it. I just loved running. So I thought, well, if I could do this full time as a career, uh, as a job, that would be ideal. So that's what I started working towards, is trying to be a full-time professional runner, just because I enjoy it. I just really uh, like it. I'm not, by nature, a competitive person. Uh, you know, I just, just something I like to do. So, unfortunately, soon after I got injured, I ran too much, did too much too soon, and I got a stress fracture. So I started swimming cycling to try and maintain my fitness while, um, while I was injured. And I realized I really liked swimming and cycling as well. So I thought, okay, well, swimming, cycling, running, that's triathlon. Maybe I could do triathlon full-time and have that as my career and have that as my job. And I thought this would be ideal. This would be perfect. And I like to say, by nature, I'm not really a competitive person. So uh, I wasn't doing this to, to try and prove anything to myself and anyone. I just like doing it. So um, I'm not really a motivational type speaker. So I thought about overcoming odds and like breaking through barriers and trying to push myself to extremes. I just liked it. So I hope that doesn't but uh, soon after, I decided to do Ironman Triathlon. Ironman Triathlon is made up of a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike ride, and a marathon. So 26.2 miles. So obviously a really long event that if you want to do well at, you have to train a lot. But like I said, I enjoyed the training, so that was, that was the easy part for me. Uh, just because I liked it. But what surprised me is when I started looking into this seriously, and I found that some of the top athletes in the world we're doing the identical training to the average athletes. Their training programs differ very little. And of course I asked myself, well, if some of these guys are top in the world and others are just average, what is it that separates that? Uh, obviously it's not the training. So there's another factor there that is allowing some to become world class while others remain average in the same training. So I started to investigate that. And I found it had more to do with what happened between the training as opposed to the actual training itself. So, the recovery phase, the phase that your body regenerates and renews itself after exercise is what I realized was the most important phase. And of course, when we rest, we eat well, our body overcompensates and it becomes stronger. That's why training works, is that overcompensation by our body, but that can only happen during the recovery phase and when our cells regenerate and renew themselves. So that's where I began to focus, was on that renewal process. And I realized that around 80% of recovery could be attributed to good nutrition. So obviously an overwhelming amount. So that's what I started focusing on was nutrition. And that's why I got interested in nutrition at a very early age. I mean, I didn't care about nutrition just for the sake of nutrition. I cared about it because I knew it would stack the odds in my favor of having the career I wanted as an athlete. And I've never really been interested in nutrition. I'm still not. But I'm interested in the outcome of good nutrition. Uh, the, the mental clarity, the ability to get away with less sleep, the ability to be more productive, which you know, I don't need to tell you people about. So things like that that are uh, very tightly tied to good nutrition, what it can do for you. So I became quite interested in this, and I started trying different ways of eating to see if I could boost my performance with these, these different types of diets. And I tried the whole gamut. I tried high carb, low carb, high protein, low protein, and nothing really impressed me. I mean, some were better than others, but nothing was really amazing. And I found that. Um, I, I wasn't really getting the results I wanted, so I kept on trying different ones, and I tried a completely plant-based diet, so vegan, completely vegan diet, and it didn't work. At first, I was always hungry, I was tired, and I wasn't recovering well, and my high school track coach asked me what I was doing wrong, and I told him I was trying this, this new diet, this new way of eating, and he was a very good coach, but because he was so good, he was somewhat closed-minded. Uh, he had had a lot of success, he had the template that worked, he put all his athletes through it, they got results, so he wasn't willing to, to change. And he had zero interest in this new way of eating. And that discouraged me at the time, but when I look back on that, I think that was actually a good thing, because it helped me to realize that if this top-level coach doesn't place any value in good nutrition, then probably a lot of other top-level coaches don't either. So I thought, okay, well, if I can find a recovery program that works well for myself, maybe that's the sort of thing that could then be passed on to athletes uh, through, through coaches. And he, like I say, was, was resistant to this, but I, I kept on pursuing it and, and looking into ways to, to boost performance through, through uh, better nutrition. I tried a whole bunch of different ways of eating, 
like I say, those different uh, high carb, low protein, all, all sorts of things. And then the plant-based way, uh, I started investigating further. I thought, I think there's something to this. I'm just doing it wrong. And I was doing it wrong. I was basically eating a, a junk food vegan diet. And that's very easy to do. Um, and keep in mind, too, when, when I'm telling the story, this was happening in 1990. So information didn't flow the way that it does today. So information about plant-based nutrition was very hard to come by. Information about sport-specific plant-based nutrition was near impossible. So I had to do a lot of research and really find out what, what would help me. And I, I, I revealed five major things initially that I was lacking in my diet through this vegan junk food diet. And it was complete protein, vitamin B12, iron, calcium, and omega-3 fatty acids. So pretty major stuff that I just simply didn't have in my, my nutrition program. So as I investigated, I, I did some research more. I found what uh, each of these nutrients uh, came from, which plants. And then I found those plants, started blending them together, had a blended drink every day after my workout. And it really did work. It did allow me to speed recovery. It didn't taste very good, but it was functional. It got me what I wanted. It got me to the point where I could do considerably more training than the people I trained with. And that was a huge advantage because then, of course, obviously my performance improved at a quicker rate and I got closer to achieving my goal of, of having that career that I wanted. So I was pleased with that. In 1990, um, I, I started all this. In 98, I started my professional career as an athlete, as an Ironman athlete. So I did that seven years full time. and. It, it was great. I really enjoyed that, that seven-year period. It went, it went well. But in 2004, I was hit by a car when I cycling, and I couldn't race that year. And obviously not a good thing to have happen, but for the first time I had time. I had freed up all this time. I had always been training and racing and didn't have time for anything. So this was kind of exciting to me. And I've been getting asked the same questions over and over. Because people knew that I raced at a high level. They knew I ate a plant-based diet. So I was always getting asked, where did I get my calcium, my iron, my protein, all these things. So I decided to address those and write about them in a short book that I published, it's called Try. It's a self-published book, about 100 pages long, and it came out in 2004. Then I expanded it, added a bunch of new ideas, expanded on the ideas that existed, and added in about 100 recipes. And that became called The Thrive Diet. It was published by Penguin in Canada, and then published the following year here. Uh, I went back to being called Thrive. Apparently, uh, the word diet is not so popular here, so they're not that out. Um, so it's just, if you see a book called Thrive Diet, it is the same book as Thrive. Different publisher, different cover, different title, same book. Uh, and anyway, so what I want to do today is kind of go over some of the main ideas in in those books that you can use to apply to your life, whether you're athletic or not. They're very broad, so they will help you uh, perform better. Like I said, whether you're an athlete or you just want to uh, maximize your ability to think clearly, or reduce sleep uh, amount, and by increasing quality, uh, cut sugar cravings, starch cravings, all those things. I should also mention, in 2004, I partnered with someone else, and we collaborated and made a replica of the blender drink I've been making for myself for years. And that is now available in Whole Foods and pretty much all health food stores. It's called Vega Complete Whole Food Health Optimizer. We'll have samples for you after. Actually, we'll have full, full cups if you want to kind of load up on that. Um, as, as I finish speaking here, you're welcome to. We'll make some of that and give it a try. So that's been out for six years in Canada, five years here. Uh, but anyways, first thing I want to talk about uh, pertaining to the book is something I call gaining energy through conservation as opposed to consumption. And what I mean by that is eating foods that use less energy to digest and assimilate, but give you more nutrients in return. Now, I've made a mistake for years, and I think a lot of people make this mistake. It's very common. To assume that since the calories measure food energy, you would think that the more calories you ate, the more energy you have. Seems to make sense. But if that were really true, people who eat lots of fast food, lots of high calorie foods, would have more energy than everyone else, and they don't. So the problem is, is that you have to spend energy to digest and assimilate these highly processed foods. And when you spend something, you no longer have it. You know, it's like anything, it's like money. If you spend it, it's gone, you don't have it. However, you can make a good investment and get a return on that investment. So that's the way we handle eating food, is something uh, that I would get a return on if I made the right choice. So. For example, I went from eating tons of bread and peanut butter. Not that that's the worst thing in the world to eat, but it is very highly processed. It was, it was white bread, it wasn't very good bread, and uh, processed peanut butter. So you spend a lot of energy to just assimilate that food, so you have less of it. Pretty simple that way. Plus, it has very few nutrients in it. And when 
replacing nutrients, I'm speaking of micronutrients. You know, we don't lack calories. Calories are very, very easy to get. It's the micronutrients that a lot of us lack. And micronutrients are vitamins, minerals, uh, phytochemicals, antioxidants, all those things are the base to good health that by eating this way, I was getting the calories, but I wasn't getting the micronutrients. So I switched over and started swapping out uh, white bread and even regular bread um, and, and pasta and, um, and all types of flour, all types of refined starchy foods. Swapped those out, started eating uh, most of my carbohydrate from fruit. Fruit is a great source of carbohydrate. It digests much more easily than these refined carbs. Plus, there's more micronutrients. So, less energy out, more micronutrients in. I call that high net gain food. So that's the first part that I, I go into detail about in my book, is how to base your diet on high net gain food. Now, another high net gain food, in addition to just fruit, is something called pseudo grains. So things like amaranth, quinoa, buckwheat, wild rice. These are technically seeds, they're not grains. So they don't have gluten, they digest more easily. Because they are seeds, they have more protein. They're around 25% protein as opposed to a grain that would be much lower. So just making that little change to my diet, I found I had significantly more energy. Yeah, my calories dropped 20, 30%, but more energy, because like I said, I wasn't spending so much together. Plus, I started getting more micronutrients in. Now when you get the micronutrients in, that's gonna help turn off your hunger signal. Now our hunger signal, of course, it's a primal signal that goes back to our earliest ancestors that tells us we need food. And we need food for fuel and building blocks. So as soon as we get hungry, that's a sign. It's a biological sign. It's being sent from our brain to tell us to eat. Now, the problem is, most North Americans, a lot of the food we eat lacks micronutrients. So our hunger signal remains active. So white bread, as an example. White bread, pretty much no micronutrients. But you can eat it. It would physically fill up your stomach but you're still going to be hungry. You're still going to want to eat, keep eating because that chemical hun hunger signal remains active. Now, that's the number one reason for obesity in North America. It's very simple. We overconsume. But the reason we overconsume is because there's so few micronutrients in the food we have these days that we keep on eating. And until we get the micronutrients to satisfy our hunger signal and turn it off. And of course, that, that's a lot of food. And then that's a lot of calories. And that's why people gain weight. And of course, when you gain weight, your risk factor for a whole bunch of diseases goes up. So type 2 diabetes, arthritis, osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, all these things. So if we eat those nutrient-dense whole foods, and I'll go into some specifics in a bit here, uh, we're going to get full much more easily. We just don't want to keep eating. So very clearly, I'm not an advocate of portion control. I think if you're hungry, you should eat. Food is not the enemy. Food is good. Food is a good thing to be eating. When we get ourselves into trouble is because we eat uh, as North Americans, a lot of highly refined foods that do not turn off our hunger signal and just create um, a wealth of calories that we simply do not need. And it's, it's actually very common now to be overfed yet undernourished. I mean, that would have been a paradox you know, 15, 20 years ago, but now it's pretty much the, the norm. Uh, and people who are obese are commonly showing symptoms of malnutrition. And you figure, how can you eat so much to become obese yet be malnourished. Very strange. But that's a testament to uh, the direction our, our food system's gone with producing, yeah, a lot of calories, a lot of starch, but very few micronutrients. So, like I say, basing the diet on those high net gain foods, a little energy out, lots of micronutrients in, and we, we steer clear of that. Now, something else I think is really important is the relationship between stress and hormones. Now, they're very, very tightly intertwined. A lot of people don't realize this. I didn't realize this until, uh, until I experience the downside of it. And this is really a lot of what my book is, is me making mistakes, taking years to figure them out, and then uh, you know, remembering and putting them into a book. So hopefully you don't have to make the same mistakes. But stress, doesn't matter where it comes from, is perceived by your body the same way. And it has the same physiological response, which is causing cortisol to go up. Cortisol is a stress hormone. So stress can come from too much work, not enough downtime, you know, traditional stress. Concerns about family, concerns about relationships, concerns about uh, professional problems. Walking down the street, breathing polluted air, that's environmental stress. Or eating food that takes a lot of energy to digest, but gives you very few nutrients in return, is nutritional stress. You know, work without getting something back is, is biologically stressful, uh, as far as your body's concerned. So, all those things, even psychological stress, like worrying about things you have no control over. Stress. You know, some people are more prone to that than others. I'm sure you know personality types that worry about everything, and you know 90% of those things they can't control. So.
So that's just extra stress that you don't need. So when that happens, any one of those things triggers a stress response. Cortisol will go up. When cortisol goes up, several bad things happen. One, physiologically, you will not be able to get to deep phase of sleep called delta. That's a really deep rejuvenated phase that, as North Americans, most of us never get into. And the reason for that, of course, cortisol being high, so then we don't sleep equally. We don't get to this deep delta phase of sleep. So what happens is, of course, we wake up and we're still tired. And then when we do eventually get out of bed, we crave coffee and sugar. Coffee and sugar works. They give us energy right away, but it's through stimulation. And obviously, it's treating the symptom of fatigue. It's not treating the cause. The cause is we didn't sleep well. We didn't sleep well because cortisol's high. Cortisol's high because of stress. So it all comes back to that. So if you do drink coffee, uh, and kind of use that as, as a crutch to, to overcome this, it just perpetuates the circle. And then we become dependent um, on these stimulants. And I realized that if I was going to be successful as an athlete, I'd have to break that, that cycle. And it's hard to do. You look around and see all the coffee shops, donut shops, it's very clear. We're a society that is dependent on, on these stimulants. But as we lower cortisol, and I'll give you specifics in a minute how to do this, but cortisol starts to come down, you sleep deeply, you wake up, you're fresh, you're rested, you're ready to go, you don't pay coffee, you don't pay sugar. To treat the cause of the problem, not the symptom. Now, the downside to this, of course, is that it's not instant. It will take uh, a couple weeks to kick in. You drink coffee, obviously, it's immediate. This is not immediate. So you have to be prepared to put in a little bit of uh, effort and invest a little bit in that. But of course, once it happens, then the problem is solved. You don't deal with it anymore. Another huge advantage to reducing cortisol is that when you sleep more deeply, when you get to that deep delta phase of sleep, your quality, obviously, is getting better. So therefore, naturally, your quantity will come down. So maybe you used to need eight or nine hours of sleep a night. Now you can get away with seven. And that's obviously very beneficial. I mean, anyone, I'm sure, could benefit from an extra hour of sleep a night, or an extra hour of not having sleep a day. So it's kind of like daylight savings every day, basically. You know, you put lock out and get an extra hour. So it's great. It's uh, obviously a very practical solution to freeing up more weight and time by improving sleep quality. Um, and quantity will just fall. And I'm, I'm sure you've noticed this too. I'm sure you've had conversations with people and you're wondering, are these people totally paying attention? Are they fully awake? And the answer is probably no, they're not. Because when they're sleeping, they probably weren't fully asleep. So that line has become blurred between being asleep and being awake. We don't sleep fully deeply. When we're awake, we're not fully awake. You know, some people. So, uh, obviously defining that line is a big advantage. Deep sleep and then complete being awake focus, concentration, and obviously productivity, stuff like that, goes goes up. Um, so I'm sure you can all appreciate that. As with sleep, um, another problem with high cortisol level is the inability to tone muscle and lose body fat efficiently. Now again, I learned this the hard way. I was training in 1997, 35, 40 hours a week. I was trying to build up for my first, what would hopefully be my first professional career as a triathlete. Uh, for the following year, and I was training 35, 40 hours a week. It was great up until about the fourth week. And then I started, uh, first of all, I started getting really tired. And I thought, well, that stands to reason I'm exercising a lot, but the more tired I got, the worse my ability to sleep became. And I realized now, of course, that's because I caused cortisol to go high, which had prevented me from sleeping deeply. So I had to compensate by adding extra sleep. And it got my season back on track, but I was sleeping nine hours a night, and obviously you don't want to do that. I had to make up for the, you know, the shortcomings of my quality of sleep by offsetting it with, um, with more quantity. Uh, but that, like I said, got the season back on track, didn't understand it, so I wasn't addressing it properly, but now I know, of course, if it had been through better nutrition, it would have reduced cortisol. What started to happen though, the following year was even more strange. I began gaining weight. And it wasn't muscle, it was fat. I started gaining about a pound of fat every three weeks. And I thought, how is it possible to gain fat when I'm exercising 35, 40 hours a week? No idea of why. So I started asking around. I started asking the so-called professionals, reading a lot of books, and everyone said the same thing. If you're gaining weight, it's simple, you're taking more calories than you burn. And I thought, well, you know, that's, that's pretty strange, because yes, I was taking a lot of calories, but the amount I was burning, I thought there's no way what I'm taking in is in excess of that. It just can't be. But I was out of ideas. I had no idea what was going on. So I tried a suggestion. I cut back the amount of food I was eating. I started gaining weight more quickly, about a pound every two weeks. And I thought, how is this possible? I'm hardly eating, I'm gaining fat, and I'm exercising 35, 40 hours a week. I don't get it. 
And I didn't get it until about a year and a half later, until I spoke with an endocrinologist who explained to me the relationship between stress and hormones. Now, what I'd done is I had overtrained. So that's physical stress. Of course, exercise is good, uh, but in excess, it's, it's not. And I stepped over the line. So I had put so much physical strain in my body from it having to try and uh, recover from all this exercise that I caused cortisol to be chronically elevated and I burned up my adrenals. So I uh, wasn't sleeping well. But also, when cortisol goes high, it's near impossible to tone muscle and lose fat. In extreme cases, you'll gain fat. So that's exactly what was happening to me as I had gone to that extreme. And I think a lot of people are in that situation, not from necessarily overtraining stress, but just stress. Work, family, all those things I mentioned before. So it causes cortisol to go up. So that means it's very difficult to, uh, to tone muscle and lose fat and break through those athletic plateaus. So if you've been working out consistently and you can't seem to get the results that you think you should, look at your life holistically. Look at all those other stresses and all those other things going on as opposed to just calories in, calories out. Um, the reason I started gaining weight more quickly when I cut back on the amount of food I was eating was because I was now depriving my body of nutrition. I wasn't giving the body, my body the fuel it needed to fuel these workouts or the building blocks it needed to recover from. So that was just a greater stress. I just placed more stress on my body, which caused cortisol to go up even higher, which caused me to gain fat more quickly. So on the surface, that seemed counterintuitive. Obviously, if you're exercising a lot, you're not eating much, and you're gaining weight, well, the tendency, of course, is to exercise more and eat less. That was the opposite of, of what I should have done. What I should have done is ate more nutrient-dense, whole, high-necking foods, and alkaline-forming foods. I'll talk about that in a minute. And that would have started to uh, bring cortisol back down. So I think, like I say, a lot of people are in that situation. I'm sure you've seen people like that. You see them at the gym, you go to the gym regularly, you see the same people like week after week, maybe month after month, year after year, you see the same people at your gym. And they can't lose that last five to 10 pounds or change their body shape, whatever. And I'm sure if you were to go to those people and ask them what was going on, I'm not suggesting you do that, by the way. <laughs> if you were to do that, they'd probably be confused. They pro probably wouldn't know what the problem was. Uh, but then if you started looking at it holistically as a person, and not just the machine, calories and calories out, but you started asking about their professional life, their personal life, and you saw all the things that caused worry and concern in their life, there's your answer. Worry, concern, stress, cortisol. So essentially those people are, and I, I, I was, hormonally injured. And that's the way the endocrinologist explained to me. And I think that's an excellent way to look at it because, of course, you can't see it. You know, like another type of injury, broken arm or something, but it's still an injury. Uh, when your hormones are so far out of whack that you cannot uh, tone muscle and you can't not lose fat. So, something to consider. You know, if you're in that situation, you exercise diligently and you can't seem to break through uh, or even go backwards, then take a look at all the other things in your life. Now, easier said than done in some cases. Now, I understand that obviously there's a lot of stresses in our life that we can't control. You know, there's things, uh, family related, work related, some of those things are out of our control. I will say one thing to that though. Perception also has a large component to do with, uh, with stress. If you perceive something is stressful, it's stressful. So as an example, I like to run. So for me to go for a run, I actually get a greater physiological benefit than someone who has to force him or herself to go for a run. So if you don't like running, don't run. Pretty much that simple. People say yoga is great for stress relief. Yes, that's true, if you like yoga. If you don't, <laughs> not so good. So I think when you select your activity too, find something that you really do enjoy and know that that is actually going to have a greater benefit to your end, your end goal. Now, I was, I was kind of um, flailing around with this, trying to fix this for a while, and it, it wasn't until I, I pieced those things together that it really made sense to me. So, what I am going to say as well, when I was researching the book, I found that of the average North America's total stress, 40% can be attributed to poor nutrition. 40% is huge. Mm -hmm. Now, at first I thought that's terrible. You know, we're doing that to ourselves. We're placing all this extra stress on us by making poor food choices. But then I realized that was actually a good thing because we all control what we choose to eat. I mean, we make those choices, obviously. Like I say, we don't all control those other aspects that cause the stress, but we control what we, uh, what we put in our mouth. So, therefore, we have a lot of control over uh, lowering cortisol and treating the cause of these symptoms, which of course is overall stress. So, uh, the high net gain foods, those can be the base. That's going to reduce a large amount of cortisol, therefore a large amount of overall stress, therefore you know, free up a lot of those problems. 
I spoke a bit about acid alkaline, and I think uh, that that's worthy of talking a little more about. That's something that is better understood now than it was even just a few years ago, but as North Americans, we're actually getting osteoporosis at a younger age than ever before in history. And originally, that was thought, uh, the reason for that is that we weren't having enough calcium in our diet. Turns out not to be the case. The reason we're getting osteoporosis at such a young age is because we take too much calcium out of our bones. And we do that by eating acid-forming food. So anything that uh, is highly processed, white flour, white bread, synthetic vitamins, synthetic drugs, meat, dairy, uh, soda, all that stuff. Standard American diet, 100% acid-forming. So what happens when you eat that is your body has to compensate. It has to offset this acid-forming food from into your body. So what it does is it pulls calcium, which is highly alkaline, out of the bones into the blood to keep it neutral. Neutral pH is 7.35. So blood is going to stay that way as a survival mechanism. But in doing so, it draws calcium from the bones. And you can imagine over the course of one, two, three decades of eating every meal, every snack, being acid forming, you're going to get weaker bones and then eventually osteoporosis. So that's why it's not uncommon now to see people who've grown up in the standard American diet have osteoporosis in their 20s. So best thing you can do, obviously, alkaline forming. Uh, alkaline forming foods are basically any whole plant-based foods. They're going to be much more alkaline forming. The less that's been done to them, the better they're going to be. The most alkaline forming foods are the green foods. So anything uh, with chlorophyll, spinach, kale, anything like that, chlorella, spirulina, uh, which are both in vega as well to keep it alkaline, those really help keep you alkaline. So big salad every day, best thing you can do for your bones, uh, smoothie with greens in it, great for your bones. But another huge advantage to keeping alkaline is functionality. If, if you eat acid-forming food, that uh, promotes inflammation. And if you have arthritis, obviously that's, you know, that's a given. That's going to make a big difference by just switching over. But even if you don't, just an average person, you think if you have to work harder for every muscle contraction because they're inflamed, you won't even know they're inflamed. Uh, that takes energy. So just walking across the room, you have to spend energy, obviously, to do that. And if you spend it, you have less of it. So by the end of the day, you're going to be more tired. Which, uh, obviously, again, you know, it's just creating a more efficient body by reducing inflammation that is going to free up uh, your ability to move efficiently. Now, as an athlete, that becomes more important even. You think of all the muscle contractions during a 5K, 10K, marathon, triathlon, there's a lot. So if you have to work hard for everyone, you're going to needlessly spend energy inefficiently. So by eating these alkaline forming foods, uh, functionality improves because inflammation goes down. Now, obviously I'm, I'm an endurance athlete, so it's all about strength to weight ratio. I want to be strong, but I want to stay light. Uh, and that's a great way to do that. Obviously, eating this way you know, keeps, keeps you pretty lean, pretty light. But what about if you want to build muscle? What if you're a bodybuilder? What if you're a power lifter and you want to uh, put on some muscle? Can this type of eating help? And yes, it can. Right after a workout, you're inflamed, your muscles are torn down, broken from the exercise, and your body has to uh, rebuild. So you need protein, those building blocks. But the problem is a lot of proteins, animal-based protein, whey protein, uh, anything from an animal, is going to be more acid forming. So if you eat alkaline forming proteins, plant-based proteins like hemp protein, spirulina protein, um, alfalfa, anything like that, uh, rice protein, uh, those things have chlorophyll in them, they're more alkaline forming, they're going to reduce inflammation right after your workout. Now, when you reduce inflammation after your workout, like I say, your functionality goes up. When your functionality goes up, your ability to lift heavier weight improves. So you'll be able to lift heavier weight next time you're in the gym, which is what makes you bigger and stronger. Lifting heavier weight is what builds bigger, stronger muscles. So eating this weight in itself is not going to make you stronger or bigger, but it will allow you to train harder, which is going to make you bigger and stronger. So it just kind of paves the road to that. Now, I'll talk uh, specifically, too, about some other ways to reduce overall stress. I talked about, obviously, perception of different things, perceiving as stress, and how you deal with that, and food, just the high net gaining foods, the alkaline forming foods. But there's something called maca as well, spelled M-A-C-A. It's a root vegetable from Peru. It's grown at around 15,000 feet. And as with any plant, it's really just a conduit for the nutrients that are in the soil. So it draws nutrition, vitamins and minerals, well, minerals, draws them out and it extracts vitamins in, in, its, uh, in its tissue by doing that, and then it passes it on to the animal or the person who, who eats it. So it's really just a conduit for, for uh, good quality soil. Now, what makes maca unique is it has the ability to grow in this uh, very uh, 
difficult climate. So very hot in the day, very cold at night, other plants can't grow at this altitude, uh, but map can. So it uh, monopolizes all the nutrients from this volcanic soil and then will pass it on to, to you, which helps rebuild adrenal function. So it was around seven or eight years ago, I found out, out about MACA, started adding to my blender drink, and it made a big difference. It took about six weeks to kick in, but once it did, I noticed better sleep quality right away, and I noticed uh, just obviously then once you start sleeping better, you have more energy, and then you cut sugar cravings, starch cravings, all those things. So it kind of got things back on track. So if you're eating those highly alkaline forming foods, uh, and if you're eating uh, those high energy foods, and you still find you have the symptoms of stress, which are general fatigue, two or three in the afternoon, sugar cravings, starch cravings, especially in the evening, dependence on stimulants like coffee and sugar to get going, difficulty toning muscle, losing fat, even though you exercise, all those things. Those are signs of high cortisol. Those are signs that you probably have a lot of stress in your life, which is, you know, it's common. I mean, that's in North America, especially, you know, high achievers. People have got a lot to do. They've got a lot of things to work on, a lot of projects, a lot of big stuff to do. It's, uh, you know, it's the norm. So that's normal. It's how you how you offset all that with the good nutrition that um, can make the difference. So, uh, like I say, I about two and a half grams of macro a day uh, help, help me get through that. So you may want to consider that. It is in Vega as well. So if you are having half to a full serving of Vega a day, you won't get that anyways. And like I say, we'll have, uh, we'll have some for you after to, to try.